Okay, we're going to do another session. Uh, the number of topics we can do today is by nature limited. It's only a three hour review. Uh, offline, I've talked some to students about uh, discovery of the Erie Doctrine. Um, we're going back on CAM now, and what we're going to talk about um, are motions, pre-trial motions, uh, trial motions, post-trial motions. And I think an appropriate and hopefully helpful starting point is uh, this handout on my website it compares a lot of the major motions, right? Um, a 12B6 motion, a 12C motion, a Rule 56 motion, a 50A and a 50B motion, and it's not on here, but also a Rule 59 motion for a new trial. And to distinguish what these motions are and how they work, keep in mind the materials the court can consider and the time when those motions are typically uh, done. Okay? So for example, a 12B6 motion to dismiss, all right? It can be done any time through trial, but it's typically done early in the litigation, right? P has sued D, and now D is moving uh, to dismiss, saying that the motion, that the uh, complaint fails to state a claim. Now what materials can the court look at in determining this motion? Well, the face of the complaint, right? We assume all the well-pleaded facts to be true. We disregard any conclusions of law. And under Iqbal and Twombly, ask whether the claim, rather the complaint, states a claim that is plausible on its face. Here, we're not concerned whether the allegations are true or not. The allegations are not evidence. We just hypothesize. We assume them to be true and ask whether or not they state a claim. That's a 12B6 motion to dismiss, all right? A 12C motion for judgment on the pleadings is not often asserted. Um, it's typically early in the litigation. The difference between a 12B6 and a 12C is 12B6 is done simply on the face of a pleading containing the claim. So that's typically attacking the sufficiency of the claim in the complaint. A 12C is not a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim, but rather a motion for judgment on the pleadings. So that means the pleadings have closed. So for example, you have your complaint and you have your answer. Okay? So the movement on a 12C might be a plaintiff, might be a defendant. The plaintiff might move for judgment on the pleading. Say you sue me for negligence and you indeed state a claim. You have sufficient facts in there to state a plausible claim. And guess how I answer your complaint? Admitted, 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 admitted. <laughs> well, if you've had enough facts in there to state a plausible claim and have admitted all the pertinent facts, do we really need a trial? Do we need a fact finder? Perhaps not, right? So you, Ms. Plaintiff, might move for judgment on the pleadings and seek a judgment on the pleadings on the basis of liability. We still might need a limited trial on the question of the extent of damages, but liability would be determined by a motion for judgment on the pleadings. Equally so, a defendant might move for judgment on the pleadings, and then that would basically be like a 12B6 motion for failure to state a claim, but that most, that rather, that defense of failure to state a claim would instead be asserted through 12C. More likely to see a 12B6 than a 12C on the bar exam. The only difference is 12B6 only looks in the face of the complaint. The 12C looks at all the pleadings. A Rule 56 motion for summary judgment, in theory, can be sought very early in the litigation, but as a practical matter, is not going to be really appropriate until we've reached the point where the parties have had an opportunity uh, to do affidavits or even to do discovery, okay? And the scope of the materials that are reviewed in a summary judgment motion are much broader than in a 12B6 or 12C motion. A Rule 56 summary judgment motion is going to look at affidavits, deposition uh, testimony, documents produced, interrogatory answers, um, admissions, in response to requests for admissions, medical exams, um, etc. In other words, affidavits plus lots and lots of discovery materials. And with a summary judgment motion, the question is not whether the complaint states a claim. The question is, do we need a jury? 
is there a need for a jury or a fact finder to decide disputed or disputable questions of fact? If the answer to that question is yes, then a motion for summary judgment ought to be denied. If the answer to that question is no, there is no genuine dispute regarding the facts that are material to the lawsuit, say a claim or a defense, if we don't have any genuine dispute of facts, then we don't need a jury. And instead, what the court can do is determine the undisputed facts and then enter judgment as a matter of law. Now, that may be partial summary judgment on an issue, or it might be a, a summary judgment on a claim, or one or more claims, or one or more defenses, or it might be on the entire case itself. Or you can even have cross motions for summary judgment. P sues D for trademark infringement, and they move for cross motions for summary judgment on whether or not there's liability, right? Our summary judgment is going to be all of this stuff and typically going to be appropriate much later in the trial. And summary judgment ought to be before trial, right? Because the very point of summary judgment is to determine whether or not there's going to be trial. I have a question, Professor Nathanson. Yes, Paola. Both parties are moving for the motion for summary judgment. Doesn't that imply that there is a conflict of, there's a material dispute of, there's a dispute of material facts? Not necessarily. We how, need to know, how, the how question how? is, if there's a cross motion, cross motion for summary judgment, does that mean there's a concession that there's no dispute as to material facts? And my response, Paola, is it depends. In fact, in many cases, P and D will make cross motions for summary judgment, and they will, in fact, stipulate that there's no dispute as to the material facts, and they simply want the judge to decide who wins under the undisputed facts. Oftentimes, there is uh, stipulated facts. Other times, however, you might have one party moving for summary judgment on liability and another party, a defendant, moving for cross motion for summary judgment on affirmative defense, in which case you may have no stipulations regarding the facts, or more commonly, you may have some stipulations from the parties as to which facts are uh, conceded or, 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 or not, um, not disputed, right? So it just kind of depends on the posture. The difference between a Rule 56 summary judgment and a Rule 50 uh, a motion for judgment of a matter of the law is primarily when that motion takes place. Now, a Rule 56 motion for summary judgment is before trial. We're not looking at the trial evidence or the trial testimony because trial hasn't happened yet. Instead, we're looking at stuff that would be used at trial, right? Like the deposition testimony is stuff that people would say at trial. An affidavit itself is a document where somebody um, signs a document under penalty of perjury saying, if I testify at trial, this is what I would say. So it's kind of like a peek ahead of trial. With a Rule 50, that is trial is actually going on, right? And a 50A is during trial, but before the jury goes to deliberate. Rule 50B is after the jury has come back with a verdict, right? So you have judgment for a matter of law, also known more commonly as directed verdict, or a renewed motion for judgment as a matter of law, uh, more commonly known as a JNOV motion, judgment notwithstanding uh, the verdict. Okay. Well, here, we're not looking at what might be used at trial. We're looking at what was actually used at trial, right? So that would be the testimony. Those would be documents entered into evidence and so forth. All right? Motion for judgment as a matter of law cannot be made by a party until the opposing party has been fully heard on the issue. So say, for instance, I'm the plaintiff, and I put on my case in chief first, okay? I'm suing somebody for negligence. And I put on my case in chief, and then I'm done, and I rest. And I say, Your Honor, I have done such an amazing job of presenting my case in chief, I move for an immediate directed verdict under Rule 50A. No reasonable juror can find against me. Well, my motion ought to be denied, because the defendant hasn't yet had an opportunity to put on his or her own case, right? But suppose I, the plaintiff, put on my case in chief, and I say I'm done. And now it's the defendant's turn to put on his or her own case. 
Now a defendant could get up and say, hey, Nathanson, the plaintiff has had his shot. He's put on all of his evidence. And guess what? Your Honor, no reasonable jury could find in Nathanson's favor. That would be an appropriate timing for a 50A motion for judgment as a matter of law. Now, you could also wait until the end of the case. By end of the case, I mean after all the evidence has been entered, both parties have closed, but before the case goes to the jury then either party could move for judgment as a matter of law. And here what we're asking is, based on the evidence put forth, must a reasonable jury find for the moving party? Okay? And federal courts use the substantial evidence test. Okay? That means you look at both the evidence put forth by the moving party and any evidence that's also been put forth by the non-moving party. You resolve all factual differences in favor of the non-moving party and ask whether or not the moving party is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. Okay? That's the standard for a Rule 50A motion. Now, a Rule 50B motion only comes into play if there's been a 50A motion. A 50A motion must be made during trial after the non-moving party has already been fully heard on the issue. You can't make a 50B motion unless there was an earlier 50A motion during the trial on that same issue. So here's something you can't do. During trial, defendant moves for directed verdict because there's insufficient evidence of breach. Okay? Let's say the court denies the motion. You know, for JMOL for insufficient evidence of breach. Jury comes back with a plaintiff verdict. After the trial, say the defendant now moves for the very first time under 50B for JNOV, you know, ju judgment uh, for a matter of law, saying there's insufficient evidence of causation. See where I'm going with this? Motion during trial was insufficient evidence of breach. After trial, insufficient evidence of causation. You can't do that because the causation issue wasn't asserted by the defendant as being insufficient during trial. See, if you raise your objection during trial, that gives the non-moving party an opportunity to cure, to call some more witnesses to shore up their evidence. But if you wait till after trial, that would be unfair. And in fact, the Supreme Court suggested unconstitutional. So if you want to do a post-trial 50B, renewed judgment as a matter of law, you must have moved on that same basis during trial. Now, whether you're moving under 50A or 50B, it's the same standard, right? The court's asking, as a matter of law, must reasonable jurors find in the favor of the moving party? Okay? That's a question of law. The court is not supposed to be engaging in credibility determinations. It's not supposed to be weighing evidence. Okay? Instead, it's supposed to be asking, must reasonable jurors find in the favor of the moving party? Well, let's contrast this, not up on the board. Let's contrast all of this with a motion for a new trial under Rule 59. Now, now first, motion for a new trial typically takes place after there's a verdict. It doesn't have to be before there's a verdict. What if there's, for example, a motion for a mistrial? Well, that, that's a, a motion for a new trial, right? But it, it, it's typically after the jury verdict, okay? With a motion for a new trial, a district court judge has a lot more flexibility, a lot more power in determining whether or not to grant the motion. Now, in a Rule 50 motion, the judge has to say how a reasonable juror would behave. That a reasonable juror must, as a matter of law, find it one way or the other, right? But with a Rule 59 motion, the judge has more leeway. The judge can say, well, even though the jury went this way, I believe the way the jury went was against the clear weight of the evidence. And I, the judge, now get to weigh the evidence. I, the judge, now get to engage in my own independent determination of the credibility of witnesses. So I'm not going to order a new trial simply because I disagree with the jury. But if I think the jury's verdict was just clearly against the weight of evidence, then I can order a new trial. Other bases for new trials would be some sort of mistake made during trial that, that caused um, harm, not harmless error, but rather harmful prejudicial error, right? So for instance, testimony was admitted that should have been inadmissible, say, because it was hearsay, 
right? Getting back to your motions in limine, right? Um, juror misconduct. The judge gave the wrong law during the judge's um, jury instructions. Some sort of error. It wasn't just any error, but an error that had a real possibility, probability of screwing things up, maybe changing the result, right? The mere existence of an error is not enough for a new trial, because every trial has errors in it, right? So, under a rule, I believe it's 61, we have the harmless error standard. You don't have a motion for new trial granted on the basis of error, unless the error was not harmless. And here's something else courts can do uh, under Rule 59. It can do remitter, but not editor. Remitter <clears throat> is when there's a jury verdict in favor of a plaintiff, and the judge thinks that jury verdict is shockingly high, right? Say, I'm walking down the street, somebody taps me on the shoulder, I'm like, oh, the boom. You know, and, and say it causes me to twist my arm a little bit, my arm's sore for a few minutes. So let's just say that's a technical battery, all right? I sue this person for battery, and guess how much the jury comes back with in my favor? A million dollars, right? <laughs> Happy day! <laughs> Dean Garcia calls me up and says, Brother Davidson, how about a nice donation to the law school? What do you want, <laughs> right? So you guys know Dean Garcia. That's yeah. a pretty good impression, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, now it's going to be on the internet. Sorry. All right. <laughs> well, it's a shockingly high verdict, right? All right. Well, hear what the defendant's going to do. The defendant's going to say, Your Honor, I move for a new trial uh, on the basis of shockingly high damages. And here's what the judge is going to say to me, say to Davidson, Professor Davidson, you won, yeah, there was technically a battery, but come on, a million dollars, I don't know what you did to charm that jury and to give you a million dollars, but I can tell you that that's an unconstitutionally, grossly high uh, amount. So, I'm going to give you two options, Professor Nathanson. Option number one is I order a new trial on the question of damages. Option number two is you, Nathanson, agree to have your damages limited down to, say, like a thousand bucks or a hundred bucks or whatever, right? That's remitter. That's at Hobson's choice. The judge, who would be doing the retrial, right, saying to the plaintiff, hey, accept the lower amount or I'm granting a new trial on, on the damages, right? And by the way, when the judge said to me that she thinks that I should go down to like a hundred bucks. She's got to tell me how much she thinks the case is worth, right? Mm -hmm. So if I go for that new trial and I get two million dollars next time, what do you think is going to happen the second time? The same thing, right? That's remitted. Well, this is constitutional and it's per also permissible under Rule 59. What's not constitutional is the opposite of remitted, which is editor. Yeah. Okay. Here's Nathanson walking down the street. And somebody comes at him with a baseball bat and beats him senseless. And, you know, poor Nathanson suffers all kind of horrible harm. All right? His leg can't walk anymore. He's like Professor X. Nathanson becomes Professor X. <laughs> and he's turning around in his wheelchair and all that. And, and it's just awful, right? You no, know, I, I can walk. I like to walk. I'm a hyper. I like to walk. Especially after talking for three hours. <laughs> so I sue for battery. And the jury finds in my favor. It gives me an award of a dollar. I'm like, what? Well, that seems shockingly low, doesn't it? Guess what Nathanson does? Nathanson moves for a new trial on, on the basis of shockingly low damages. And now, under editor, the judge says, defendant, you either agree to up those damages to a million dollars, or I'm going to grant a new trial to Nathanson, right? That'd be editor. And actually, you can do this in some state courts, but you can't do it in federal courts. Why? Because of the Seventh Amendment. The Seventh Amendment says no issue decided by a jury shall be, be uh, re-examined uh, by the judge. Okay? Well, what the Supreme Court has said in the Dimmick case is that remitted is constitution because we're lopping off what the court said was, was it an excrescence? I'm probably getting the word wrong. Lopping off extra. So if the judge says, let's remit a million dollars down to $1,000, well, that $1,000 was within the 
million dollars the jury will award it. We're just lopping off the excess. But with Additor, all the jury awarded Nathanson was gold, right? And to, for the judge to force the defendant to increase it to a million dollars is the judge changing the jury findings to add in money that the jury never awarded in the first place. So that's the difference between remitter, which is constitutional in federal court, and Additor, which is not constitutional in federal court. The Seventh Amendment jury right, right, which applies to uh, issues of law, and on equitable issues, all right, only applies against federal courts. The Seventh Amendment jury right does not apply in state court. It only applies in federal courts. All right, let me think for a minute. How are we all on the time? Um, I'll say one more thing about summary judgment real quickly, so I'm going to go back to summary judgment, and I think it's worth looking at. This is another one of my handouts. Flavors of summary judgment. That's a really big handout. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Let me simply say the summary judgment can be sought in, in a variety of ways. Well, the first, it's a pretty rare way of doing it, but it does happen sometimes. It's when a plaintiff is moving on his own claim for summary judgment, or a defendant is moving for summary judgment on their counterclaim or on their affirmative defense. Well, that person at trial would have the burden of proving all the elements, right? And in summary judgment, as movement, they have to prove they would prevail on each and every necessary element. So if I sue you for um, negligence, and then I seek summary judgment on my negligence claim, then I have to show that there's no need for trial on the breach of the duty, causation, and the damages, right? I have to show I have probative evidence on every element, and there's no dispute regarding any of those elements. That's the proof of all elements, okay? That is hard to show. The moving party would have to show there's no genuine issue of material fact for any of those elements. More common is the disproof of one or more of my opponent's elements. So say I sued you for negligence, and you're the defendant moving for summary judgment, okay? Well, you're the defendant. You don't have to disprove all of my elements. You just have to show to the court that I can't prevail on one or more necessary elements of my claim. So for me to win against you for negligence, I gotta prove that I had a duty, that, that you had a duty that you breached that caused my damages. Okay? I know there's proximate cause and but-for cause, but I'm keeping it simple. All right. Well, you're the defendant. If you can show the court there's no way Nathanson can show breach, can Nathanson win? You're the defendant. You show the court that Nathanson can't prove breach, right? Can Nathanson win in his negligence claim? What's that? No. No. What if you show that Nathanson can't show that any breach caused his harm? Nathanson can't prove causation. Can Nathanson win? No. You prove that Nathanson suffered no damages. Can Nathanson win? No. no. You see, you knock out. It's like, it's like you're treating Nathanson's claim like it's a three-legged table or a tripod, right? Like the tripod that that camera's on right now. What happens if we knock one of the legs off the tripod? What's that? It falls. it falls down. And when Nathanson has a claim that's got multiple necessary elements, you, the defendant, don't have to disprove my entire claim. You just got to show that I'm not going to win on one of my necessary elements my whole claim falls apart. See, it's much easier to be a defendant than it is to be a winning plaintiff, right? Because the plaintiff's got to win on every element. The defendant just has to knock one thing out, and the defendant wins. Well. For a defendant seeking summary judgment against the plaintiff on the plaintiff's claim, the defendant can do it one of three ways. And I'm not going to go by the chart here. I'm just going to, going to talk through it. The first is the defendant can put forth his or her own materials, right? Say affidavits, depositions, uh, documents, anything that shows there's no issue of material fact on one or more of Nathan's plaintiff's necessary elements. But a defendant doesn't even have to put forth any materials at all. 
Remember the Celotex case? Celotex says a defendant can prevail by pointing out or suggesting to the court that the plaintiff lacks any admissible evidence on one or more elements of his claim. So what you might do, instead of putting forth your own affidavit, is you could write up a brief saying, we had all these depositions, we had all these opportunities for discoveries, we looked through all this stuff, and all of the deposition materials and all the discovery materials show that, that Mr. Nathanson has absolutely no admissible evidence that he could use at trial to show that I, the defendant, breached any duty. Therefore, I demand summary judgment. And that can be enough. So in other words, a defendant seeking summary judgment to knock out the plaintiff's claim could either put forth his own materials, say a deposition, or just point out the plaintiff has nothing but one or more necessary elements, or more commonly, combine those two methods. So keep that in mind, right? The various ways of proving summary judgment. So we're making really good time. Um, I think I'll, I'll briefly talk for a few minutes about the Rule 12 waiver provisions. Is that something worth talking about? <laughs> no? Yes? Rule 12. You remember, P sues D, D has to answer, right? The defendant has to answer, or the defendant can make a pre-answer motion to dismiss, right? All right. Well, under Rule 12, there's seven defenses that can be raised by a pre-answer motion, right? Do you remember what they are? 12B1. I can even put it up on the board. We have an app for that. Here we go. 12B1, lack of subject matter jurisdiction. 12B2, lack of PJ. B3, lack of venue. B4 and B5, improper process and improper service or process. Number six, failure to state a claim. And number seven, fail to join a party required under Rule 19, which we get to on Wednesday. Okay. Well, all of these defenses may be raised in the answer, or they may be raised in a pre-answer motion to dismiss. My battery is running low, but it's plugged in. Unless plug up knocked out. Which it did. <laughs> there we go. All right. Well, here what I'm talking about is what I refer to as the initial response rule. Okay. The initial response rule says that some Rule 12b defenses will be lost forever if not asserted in your initial response, regardless of whether that initial response is an answer or a pre-answer motion. And those, um, and those defenses are number two through five. PJ, venue, insufficient process, and insufficient service of process. Those are defenses that should be immediately available to the defendant when they're served with the uh, complaint. And they kind of fall into the category of assert it or lose it forever. So say, for example, you are sued and served with a complaint, and you do a pre-answer motion arguing lack of subject matter jurisdiction. Well, assuming the defense of PJ was available to you at the time you were served with the complaint, then your failure to assert PJ, along with your motion attacking subject matter jurisdiction, means the PJ defense is waived. All right. Similarly, with an answer, say you're sued and served, and you serve an answer asserting lack of personal jurisdiction. Okay. Six months go later. Six months go by and you want to amend your answer to include the defense of improper venue. The problem is, is your initial response didn't include venue. It just included lack of personal jurisdiction. Well, under the waiver provisions, venue would be waived. There is an escape hatch here. Um, it's something that might be testable, and I'll pull it up. What if your initial response here, what if your initial response here is an answer, there we go. Your initial response is an answer 
and you amend your answer within 21 days of serving it, okay? Now, you may recall under Rule 15, there's three ways to amend a pleading before trial. One is by consent of the parties, two is by leave of court, and the third is a matter of course. The matter of course amendment is if you amend early within a certain time frame, you have a one-shot do-over to amend as a matter of course. Well, say your initial response is an answer where you asserted lack of personal jurisdiction. And then a week later, you do your one-time amendment as a matter of course, and now you add the defense of lack of venue. Then you have not waived venue. Because even though your initial response didn't include venue, your first response was an answer, and you amended it very quickly within the time period allowed by Rule 15a to add that additional defense. Now what if you do a second amendment, right? So your first pleading is uh, asserts lack of PJ, your second pleading within a week adds lack of venue, and then you want to amend a week after that to assert, oh, uh, say, uh, improper service of process. Then you're out of luck with that last um, um, amendment because the only way to save that missing defense is to either include it in your initial uh, uh, response as an answer or in that one time, one time only, excuse me, amendment as a matter of course within 21 days, okay? But if you amend a second time, if you amend a second time, that can't be an amendment as a matter of course. And the reason being is you're allowed one and only one amendment as a matter of course. So if you do a pleading and then you amend it as a matter of course, you can't do any more amendments as a matter of course. Any additional amendments has to be either by consent or by leave of parties and doesn't serve to rescue any of these. All right, let me pause the camera. I'll take a few questions and then maybe we'll cover one more quick subject before we call it a day.